So the technical infrastructure, the material constraints, and the individual affective comportment, and broader aesthetic concerns all collectively operate, collectively operate in an as a piece that retroactively produces the parts of which it's more than the sum. So now this slide is moving. So to reiterate, in Yesterday Wants More, Pavlato works by engaging a process of attunement. And we can understand this as an act of listening, not just because she's working with sound per se, but instead because the particular type of relationality that she develops resounds beyond significance, evading any particular moment or any particular site of capture. Moreover, we can collimate this subjective vector of listening to the technical one constituted by the material histories <coughs> of audio recording, where recordings catalyze a culture of ubiquitous schizophrenic listening that's a precondition of work of this sort. Schizophrenic listening is just where the separation of recorded sound from its source is accepted without any question. We no longer ask, oh, is she really here? It's absolutely a cultural norm to accept this recording. So thus, similar processes can also be heard in works that are not explicitly sound art. And one such work uh, is Renee Lear's video installation, you can see up here, which was shown in Toronto in 2013, as a companion piece to her super slow motion daily practice developed in tandem with fast frame rate video equipment, which has recently become much cheaper. Um, tellingly, she does a live performance of this practice, this super slow motion movement, uh, as a companion piece to the installation that it's open. So the installation is presented on two large television screens uh, beside one another, with each screen featuring multiple iterations of Lear sitting and taking a drink of water with multiple with minor variations. Since it's silent, I can play it. Uh, each iteration is a particular combination of Lear's motion. Each iteration is a particular combination of Lear's motion speed, the speed that the video was shot at, and the speed that the video is played back at. So in essence, she combines human movement with the slow and fast frame rates of the video camera and the slow and fast playback times of video editing software. And as you can see, there's a three-line text on each screen that describes the playback variation currently being shown. As we move along, each video works through the various possible combinations of movement, video recording, and video playback. I don't know if you can read that, it just says, we're naming in slow motion, video at normal speed, playback at normal speed. That's her name, we at normal speed, video at fast motion, playback in slow motion. Um, so as in Pavano's work, Lear explicitly, explicitly cares less about learning the truth about motion, right? This is not like a Moybridge study from the 1870s of you know, where, where they take pictures of horses to try to understand how horses truly move. Lear explicitly cares less about learning the truth about motion and more about, as she puts it, experimenting with a new form that is at once human and video. So she's not, she's not reverse engineering a mechanical process, but rather learning through a sustained and painstaking practice how to draw out the aesthetic dimension that is always present in such scenarios, but that's suppressed by the seeming fatality of techniques. By like trying to draw out an aesthetic dimension that's suppressed by the way that extracted technical processes contain their ends and their beginnings, as we saw in Schilling's uh, understanding of insight's computation. And indeed, this is why the particular manner that Lear's piece plays out its temporal combinatorics is so striking, at least to my ears. Rather than simply presenting information, right? Rather than simply presenting the truth about motion, or even the kinds of translative differences that come with sonification, these kind of weird things that happen when you translate information from one uh, medium to another, rather than either of those, Lear's piece gives us the strange asymmetries of her human video coupling in their own right. So the formal weirdness of the piece, and it really requires spending some time with it because it's quite long. Uh, but the formal weirdness of the piece manifests in weird to move through these variations. Uh, the formal weirdness is right there to be pulled and be held by, I think, in the original <coughs> moment of viewing. Now, part of the charm of processual work, right, pieces that work, are art, works, which is a long history, that just work through a process and, and sort of lay bare. Part of the charm of processual work is typically the incipient awkwardness that appears in any translation. Part of what makes it Nice, as you sort of see these crazy things that happen as you start to sort of uh, here see these minor differences between, as it's translated 
the idea of motion is translated through different media and different bodies. But if part of the charm of processional work is typically the incipient awkwardness that he hears in translation, this piece complicates that potentiality, I think, in a manner that precludes the question of a single objective origin in favor of a kind of past to come, as Arthur likes it, Arthur Pogler. We know, after all, precisely what's coming and how, but we don't know where it's coming from. And really, I think that's why Weir tells us how each variation is made. Because there's really, literally, no risk of us under, actually understanding what those words mean, except in the most banal sense, unless we were to take, undertake the practice, which is daily, painstaking, and long, of making this ourselves. Right? We can understand that these differences are there, but that notion of understanding is not really a notion of understanding that is in sense functional. So approached differently, we might say that Lear's striving to become a video, as she puts it, isn't just an aesthetic choice, though it's that too. It isn't just about problematizing the boundary between person and machine, though it's that as well. But as most importantly, to my mind, a performative insight into the irreducibility of how such boundaries between humans and machines are constituted and maintained. So because she crosses that threshold of human and machine, she crosses it by crafting a register, an aesthetic register, where she, the video recorder, <coughs> and the video playback are functionally equivalent. Right? And by crafting that register, I think she perfectly demonstrates the way that a political language of attunement moves, for better and for worse, from the distance of criticism. I'm thinking of, uh, is it Galloway who says, um, look, you're uh, critique is always about the real, but forever against it. Right? So she's moving, uh, she's demonstrating the way that political language and attunement moves from the distance of criticism to a kind of bodily affection. Form isn't an enveloping structure in this work, but instead the capacity to entrain. So it's not incidental that Lear didn't so much become video as learn to become a video, where learning is again understood as a process of entrainment. But here, I think we could further specify the bodily dimension of this entrainment precisely and paradoxically because it's outside of Lear. Right? It's in the technical element that is in Lear, but not of her. She's bodily through the video playback <coughs> and video recorder. So what it means for Lear to become video is to become quite literally caught up in the latter's tempi and machinations precisely insofar as these point to a technical system that acts through her when she envelops it and envelops her as she acts through it. So what I hope this reading of Lear's work hints towards is a way of thinking relation outside of the nodes and edges network visualization through which I discuss notes as told at the beginning of the talk. And I'm motivated in this because I think it moves in the direction of engaging one of the substantial challenges of our time and place, it's my time and place, the challenge that Anna Munster termed network anesthesia. In this, Munster is taking note, like many others have, of the prominence that this nodes and edges style of diagram has gained in describing relations in our era of computer network technologies. So with the phrase network anesthesia, Munster names a numbing, quote, a numbing of our perception that turns us away from networks unevenness and from the varying qualities of their relationality. Put simply, Virtually every image we see, and trust me, if you look for them, you will find this to be true. Virtually every image of a network that we have is a variation of this nodes and edges network form. And this form of diagram includes the specifics of the relations it represents in favor of a generalized notion of interaction. It's no accident, of course, that this comes to such prominence in the context of late global capitalism. For the argument I'm trying to encant here, though, it's important to note the problem with network anesthesia highlights a technical conception of relation, not only in the computational sense, but also, and importantly, in the representation of frameworks that subtend visualization technologies and the graph theory with which these commingle. As Munster puts it so eloquently, quote, the shift from hierarchical to relational data, and she's using this to characterize the shift from the internet as a kind of encyclopedia, if you remember when we thought of internet that way, to the internet as an interactive framework. So the shift from hierarchical to relational data is tied into the development of a general network dispositif, coextensive with an entire social field, social field of the network. 
So it follows that network anesthesia is tied up in the affordances and constraints of specific methods of data visualization. And indeed, I expect in visualization itself as a method, because every visualization is at once dependent on its method of excluding and prioritizing data, and by definition, constitutively incapable of representing what is excluded, what is de-emphasized in the method within its representational framework. That's what it is to visualize. So as Munster puts it, what we lose through the anesthetization of networks is, quote, the experience of the edges, the experience of relation. And she goes on to cite William James to insist that the relations that connect experiences must themselves be experienced relations. If, as Ken Warwick argues, any social form resides within a communication infrastructure that gives it a certain shape, a certain tempo, that renders the infrastructure at least somewhat invisible, Munster's point is simply that this problem is intensified in contemporary technoculture. And indeed, Mark Hansen, who I, I gathered with here last year, uh, has argued persuasively that there's something different about today's new media, that there's a singular newness of new media today that's different than its plural antecedents. Different than the way that the novelty of every medium waxes as a kind of incipient innovation before waning into the sedimentary form of the medium itself. So what Hansen thinks is sing this singular newness stems from is the fact that for the first time, quote, in our history, media, meaning storage, dissemination, and transmission of experience, has become distinct from its own technical infrastructure, from the computational networks and machines that undergird most of what we consume as a media. That it, this is the case because, as I referred to earlier, uh, so much of our new media takes place according to causal logics that are beyond human scales and perception. Moreover, media also no longer mediate just a sensory experience that precedes the medium, which happens with the <coughs> image, but actually mediate something like what Hansen wants to call the media itself, which is to say the connectivity that comes with this massively distributed extrasensory technical infrastructure that we call the internet. The exemplary case of this is Web 2.0, of course, which, as Hansen points out, refocuses the function of computational media from storage to production, from the archiving of individual experience to the generation of collective presence and of connectivity itself. Now, while this singular newness of new media is in some ways an arguable assertion, probably also a question of degrees as much as fact, for the purposes of the argument I've tried to make today, I think we only have to accept that this is a thinkable thought. And so I only want to use Hansen's definition of new media as a gambit to draw a vector that connects the newness of new media to thresholds of human knowledge, and specifically to the way that such thresholds are formed. So in short, to note, as we have, that knowledge is always already in some sense technical, and at the same time that new media mediate connectivity itself, is to note an important change in the way that knowledge is technically specified in our time, which is, of course, saying speaking. It's also, I hope, to suggest that different medial intensities, such as those catalyzed by sonic encounters, might be particularly fruitful today. Because to ask the question of what it is to know something is to enter into a world of multiple temporalities, a world of iteration, archive, memory, potentials, of past futures, future pasts, and implicate presents. But what, then, is it to produce these temporalities in novel ways? Thinking algorithmic compositions such as Mertz's through, virtuality, through the virtuality that we hear in their aesthetic dimension, and thinking practices such as Pivato's as a kind of development of an effective technical attunement, and then thinking practices such as Lear's as methods of entraining ourselves to listen beyond literal sounds, each or all might contribute, I hope, to a project of drawing out the imaginative dimension of this seemingly determinist technological unconscious, and this technological unconscious that permeates contemporary capitalist culture, and thus, by drawing out this imaginative dimension, might help us to meet the challenges posed by this culture in its own key, according to its specific rhythms. So paraphrasing de Beauvoir, one is an inner listener, one becomes one. Thanks. <laughs>